Good evening. Welcome to the Lougheed College Lectures. It's great to see all of you here tonight. My name is Rhonda Braykreitz. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Human Ecology here at the University of Alberta. And I'm thrilled to see all of you here for this exciting lecture with Dr. Jody Abbott. As we begin tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. And tonight, I'd also like to acknowledge the sudden death of one of Alberta's former premiers, the Honourable Jim Prentice. His loss is a, is a loss for our province. Before we start tonight's lecture, I want to take a few moments to tell you about the context of the Lougheed College lectures. The Peter Lougheed Leadership College is part of a broader initiative called the Peter Lougheed Leadership Initiative. And this endeavor is a partnership between the BAMP Center and the University of Alberta. So the BAMP Center offers a program for executive education, and here at the U of A, the Lougheed College offers a program for undergraduate students from across faculties. And this initiative is based on a vision to create a world-class program with the university and with the Banff Center. In the spring of 2014, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell was appointed the founding principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. And the broad purpose of this college is to lead students in exploring the question, what do leaders need to know? And so through coursework and mentorship and hands-on leadership experiences, Lougheed students will build knowledge and skills that will enable them to lead in a large range of leadership positions. And our program is unique, and I just want to spend a moment uh, talking about how it's unique and why I think that's important. Uh, the content of the program is offered through faculty members and teaching fellows through a range uh, of disciplines. And as I was thinking about this, I was just thinking off the top of my head about some of the disciplines that I know are represented here. And I just wanted to list a few of them. Psychology, political science, business, anthropology, education, native studies, women and gender studies, human ecology, engineering, law, fine arts, and resource economics, just to name a few. So you can see that this is very interdisciplinary in terms of how it's being taught. Um, it's also available to students from across faculties here at the U of A. So students from engineering and history and chemistry are put together in forum groups and they have an opportunity to discuss challenging questions from different interdisciplinary perspectives. And at the Lougheed College, we think that the diversity of the educational backgrounds of our faculty, of our teaching fellows, and our students is really, really important and greatly enriches our program. Uh, through wrestling with tough issues, looking at it from different viewpoints, we think that our students will be better prepared to tackle some of the, the challenges that they will face in their leadership positions. Our first year Lougheed College students are here tonight, sitting in the middle section. Can you all give a wave, Lougheed Scholars? Welcome to all of you and your teaching fellows. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a group of Lougheed scholars that are um, at Augustana campus in Camrose. And so they are watching through live stream. And so we say hello to you as well. And we also have viewers watching through live stream uh, from Red Deer College. So we'd like to say hello to them as well. The Lougheed College lectures are part of an interdisciplinary university course called Topics in Leadership. So all of, all of us are students here tonight as we participate in this course. The purpose of this lecture series is to expose students to cutting edge research and ideas from a range of leaders throughout our community and our university. And when we were planning the Peter Lougheed Leadership College early on, we made it a priority to open these lectures up to the public because we thought it was important that anybody interested in leadership have a, an opportunity to attend these lectures. And this also honors the vision of the first president of the U of A, Henry Marshall Torrey, to uplift the whole people. It also acknowledges our responsibility as a public institution to give back to the community uh, that we are situated in. I'd now like to just uh, go over a few logistics for tonight. Uh, you'll notice when you walked in that the Campus Food Bank is here. They will be here um, every week for the Lougheed College Lectures, and we would like to invite you to make a donation uh, to that food bank. That would be very much appreciated. 
Uh, for tonight, uh, if, if you could uh, refrain from taking any video or audio recordings, that would be much appreciated. Uh, however, if you'd like to tweet out uh, pictures or quotes, that would be great as well. Um, this program is going to run until 7.15. It's going to start with the lecture from Dr. Abbott, followed by a public conversation between Dr. Abbott and the principal of our college, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. When that is complete, the Dr. Abbott uh, and the students are going to leave the lecture hall and go to their forum groups for the second half of the class. However, for those of you who are not registered in the course, but just coming for interest, we'd like to invite you to stay for an extra component. This year, the Peter Lougheed Leadership College is partnering with executive education from the Alberta School of Business. And Dr. Marvin Washington from the School of Business will facilitate a discussion among the public members following the lecture, um, looking at uh, different ideas that were uh, brought up within the lectures. And the Alberta School of Business uh, welcomes you to engage in this discussion. So we hope that you'll be able to stay for that. I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jody Abbott. <laughs> Dr. Jody Abbott is the president and CEO of Norquest College, the Edmonton Region's community college. Since joining the college in 2010, Dr. Abbott has grown the Norquest College significantly. And some of that includes credit and non-credit programming, innovative new partnerships, like the Landmark Group Center for Value Improvement, the Edmonton Oilers Community Foundation Hospitality Institute, and the Alberta Ab Aboriginal Construction Career Center. She has also enhanced Norquest's brand recognition and initiated the college's biggest campus expansion project in over 40 years, the Singmar Center for Learning. Dr. Abbott is the chair of eCampus Alberta and a member of the Young Presidents Organization. In addition, she has a long-standing involvement with figure skating. She was an Olympic judge in 2010 and 2014 and is currently a board director with Skate Canada. In 2011, Dr. Abbott was included in the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport and Physical Activity as one of Canada's top 20 most influential women in sport. She is also a two-time recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for her significant local, provincial, and national contributions in sport and post-secondary education. In 2015, she was named as a Women's Executive Network Top 100 Most Powerful Women, receiving the Trailblazers and Trendsenders Award for women who are either the first in their field or have made a major impact on it. Most recently, Dr. Abbott was named as one of the top 50 most influential people in Alberta by Alberta Venture Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jody Abbott. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here with you this evening. I want to start by asking you a question. What's the last decision that you made today? Think about it. We all make decisions almost, whoop, that was not a good start. There we go. So think about it. We all make decisions almost every waking moment. They can be simple decisions, like where did you decide to sit in this lecture hall today? Or they can be more complex business decisions, like what should the strategic reach of your organization be? Or personal decisions like, should I marry the person I love? Decisions like these are based on the analysis of facts and impacts and what your gut or your heart in terms of a marriage proposal tells you. Your life experience, whether you're 16 or 50, no doubt also plays part in your assessment. 
I think that with every decision we make, you could ask yourself if your assessment is based more on facts or analysis or your gut check. Do you consider these elements that lead to your decision equally? Probably not. I think the mix usually depends very on the complexity of the issue at hand, the context of the environment you're in, whether or not you've had practice making this kind of decision, the information you have in front of you at the particular time, and sometimes where you are at in your life. So let's use Norquest College as an example in the case of making a business decision about the strategic reach of your organization. Here's what I might consider. Is this aligned to our mandate? Why do we want to expand our strategic reach? Who else is in the market? Is there an opportunity to partner with other post-secondaries? What are the risks? And if I consider all of these things and the plan doesn't go as I intend to, what am I going to do? So risk mitigation. And how will others in the organization feel about this? Or in the case of the marriage proposal, you might consider, what do I know about this person? So the facts. If you've been married before, you might draw on that experience. So you might ask, how did that go? Or you might also consider the heart response. How could I possibly live without this person? And of course, when do I need to decide? In the case of a marriage proposal, it might have a best before date. In these examples, you could say that the more experience you have, the more logical your approach might be, less emotion, and more analysis of facts. But not always. Does that sound confusing? Well, I think it is. There is no magical solution to making the right decisions. And I would argue, what is a right decision anyways, given that the environment, timing, Facts at the time can all impact the decision you make in the moment. While there is no magical solution, there are methods that can guide you along the way. Decisions, whether they are personal or business related, all come from your assessment of the evidence and from your experience. I'll go into this a little later, but first I have another question for you to consider. How do you make good business decisions without the benefit of experience? To help answer this question, I'm going to reference key pieces of the literature and provide examples of my own evolution as a decision maker and how the decisions I made in the past help guide me in the decisions I make today and will make in the future. As you heard in the introduction, I'm the president and CEO of Norquest College. The post-secondary environment is very exciting and any leader in a college, polytechnic or university has a lot to consider. We are public entities with a variety of stakeholders. We respond to a range of opportunities and demands from our communities. We're large institutions who manage day-to-day -day operations and we often respond in a business-like way. We support and challenge our employees to be the best that they can be, and we stretch our strategic boundaries. The bottom line is we work in complex organizations. But I didn't start my career in post-secondary. My early roles were in the community-based organizations, where I had the opportunity to interact directly with clients and patients providing them with the information on how to transition from hospital home or how to re-enter the workforce. These organizations tested my decision-making skills as a frontline employee and later as I progressed into management. While these environments have a different kind of complexity, one thing is common. Regardless of my role, I was required to make decisions. Decisions that impacted my clients, my organization, and me. I have to confess that in the early years of my career, I was nervous about making decisions, especially given the environment I worked in. 
I was supporting people with disabilities whose lives had been impacted through injury, or for example, families who were both yearning for and hopeful of adopting a child. My decisions could have a direct impact on their lives, and I took this responsibility seriously. A little later, being in a gender minority as a female manager, I felt the added pressure of having to prove myself caping, capable of making the dis right decision every time. I knew I had to be accountable and that the expectations of me and by me were especially high. So I made a conscious decision. I would gather all of the evidence before making a decision. This approach is consistent with what Kahneman calls System 2 cognitive processes. These processes are characterized by some distinct features. Kahneman says these processes are slower, based on serial processing, effortful and deliberate, and consciously monitored. Decisions that we make based on these processes are often rule-governed. We use pro-con lists, cost-benefit analysis, and we weigh the options. And because of the extensive analysis we tend to invest in, we can be seen as inflexible. We rely on the use of data sets and other tangible forms of evidence that allow for concrete analysis and deliberation. Sometimes this is in an effort to uphold being neutral, fair, or democratic in our decision-making approach. Or it can allow us to point to transparency in our decisions. Because of this, others can also see the reason or logic for the decision that results. For example, think about how difficult it could be for a social worker or the courts to make an adoption decision and place a child in one family's home over another family's home. Having strong criteria for decision making and assessing against those criteria could allow for the families to be better able to understand the decision of the social worker. I would argue it also assists the social worker in feeling more comfortable because debriefing based on criteria allows the decision to be more defensible, in essence, logical and transparent. I recall earlier in my career when I was working for a national organization. The organization made a decision to centralize the fund development function that was, under the time, in my local area of responsibility. The organization provided all of the reasons why. For example, the central organization had access to specialists and access to data and analytics. And these assets were weighed, <coughs> pardon me, more heavily than the assets that lived in our community. Well, as a leader, I could support the reasoning. I also knew that we had local relationships which were critical to fundraising. This data set wasn't as tangible or concrete. This data set was obtained or and processed based on observations of an individual's or community's behavior. In the end, I think a more equal weighting of hard data and more intuitive data might have led to a more balanced decision. As we start to collect more data on the intuitive side and are more confident in the processing and reliability of hard data, we sometimes base decisions on our system one cognitive processes. Again, this is the work of Kahneman. System one processes are more intuitive. They're faster, you can process information in parallel, and they seem automatic and effortless. According to Kahneman, the decisions are based on association, they can be implicit, and they can be emotionally charged. Sometimes, when we become skilled in certain fields, decisions made based on system two processes, therefore data and facts, can become decisions based on system one processes or intuition. In essence, our brains learn patterns that will allow us to eliminate the serial processing 
we use to arrive at an answer on a certain topic. Becoming a more confident and experienced leader allowed me to defer more decisions to system one or intuitive processes. Certain decisions became more effortless and you can actually move quickly through the decisions when you're in a period of opacity or ambiguity. I'd like to share an example where I use system one processes or my gut to make a decision about recruitment. For those of you who've been involved in recruitment, you know that hiring decisions are critically important for your organization's success and as a manager, your own success. In leadership roles, I've always held the view that when creating a team, I want to hire the best talent and add a member who will elevate the entire team. In this, I consider four things. First of all, and this is obvious, skills to do the job. In some cases, this is specific expertise. So if you, you need a CFO, you would likely hire a professional accountant. In other cases, it might be that you're hiring a seasoned generalist who can work across the organization, so across functional areas. The second thing that's important to me in hiring is hiring someone who has the motivation to expand the thinking and outcomes of his team and who is not afraid to challenge his or her colleagues. And that's with the best intention to move the organization forward. Thirdly, I love to hire individuals who will challenge my thinking and importantly, my frame of reference. And finally, I always seem to have a gut feeling on whether the candidate is a fit with the organization, the team, and with me. In the last 10 years of my career, I've made some significant hiring decisions. When I reflect on these decisions, I would say most of them were sound. But as I prepared for this session and started to think about system one processes, this reliance on your gut, I realized that in one instance, I relied too much on the gut and not enough on skill sets or the hard data. I selected a candidate that aligned well with the values of the organization and my own. I thought the candidate would be a perfect match. I can tell you my initial gut was correct, but as time went on, I began to question the hiring choice. In retrospect, at the time of decision making, I was reluctant to seek out more data on key elements related to skill sets that were required in the organization. I realize now that I was overly concerned about the internal environment. People were talking about their heavy workloads, having assumed additional responsibilities. In essence, there was pressure to fill the vacancy. The lessons I learned is that it's critical to weigh all elements in this kind of decision. I had put too much weight on my gut. In this case, a delayed hire would not have had a long-lasting negative impact on the organization, but a wrong hire could have. With the luxury of time, and of course hindsight, it can be easier to decide. Sometimes our intuition and past positive decision-making outcomes can cause us to be overly confident. We may overlook or even ignore past mistakes in our judgments and assumptions. Kahneman in the Harvard Business Review in 2011 said, that is sometimes we act like, and I quote, what you see is all there is, end of quote. These mistakes and assumptions happen when you have an exaggerated expectation of consistency or a belief that the world is more regular and predictable than it truly is. These beliefs arise because the memories we hold of our past experiences and decisions form a coherent story. Eventually, this story starts to suppress alternate stories. To provide an example of this, where I believed something to be true based on instinct because of consistency, but where it was not true in every situation, I'd like to share a bit about my volunteer activities as a figure skating judge. I recall a Canadian level competition where the panel of judges had the privilege of assessing Kurt Browning. First, 
It's important to know that judges assess based on criteria and enter a score based on that criteria. In this particular competition, Kurt performed his short program and completed a jump that almost every judge on the panel assessed as a triple jump, and as such, we scored it as a triple jump. We were all confident of our assessment until the judges roundtable, and that's an opportunity where we get to debrief. Please know this is a day in the day when judges did not have instant replay, and therefore only a split second was available to assess the element. When the referee proposed that Kurt had only completed a double jump and not a triple jump, the majority of the judges were adamant that the referee was incorrect. However, when the referee showed us the videotape, it was very clear Kurt had done a double jump. This is a really good example of the panel acting like what you see is all there is, as described by Kahneman. The judges consistently saw Kurt perform the triple jump in the current season, in practices, and in past seasons. They expected to see a triple jump, and they didn't question themselves when he did a double. In fact, it was almost like we didn't see it. This is system one cognition, also known as fast thinking, and Kahneman would say it is not prone to doubt. Overconfidence in our stories, beliefs, and mental models has even been tested. So I'm going to talk about a case study of Terry Odian, a professor at University of California, Berkeley. And he analyzed the trading records of 10,000 brokerage accounts of investors over a seven-year period. In doing this, he identified the instances where an investor stole one stock and shortly after purchased another one. Odian took this to mean that the investor had an idea about the future performance of the two stocks. The one that would, was purchased would perform better than the one that was just sold. Odeon then compared the returns of the two stocks and found that the results were undeniably poor. The shares the investors sold did better than the ones purchased by 3.3%, which is seen, was seen as a substantial margin. In further research on this topic, Odeon found that the most active traders had the poorest results than those who traded the least, and the, those who traded the least earned the highest returns. Makes you think, doesn't it? Generally, the investors held onto an illusion of having skill in an area where the data show that good results were more likely due to good luck. They trusted their intuition that the decisions they were making on the sale and purchase of shares was going to be profitable for their clients. So in essence, they went with their gut. And as Sol Milkman and Payne pondered, I quote, unless you occasionally go against your gut, you haven't put your intuition to the test. You can't really know it is helping you make good choices if you've never seen what happens when you ignore it, end of quote. Without reflecting critically on the results of their investment decisions, the investors had no data or logic to test their intuition. Kahneman calls this being blind to your own blindness. So if we go back to my recruitment example, I would argue that my reliance on gut related to the importance of fit in the organization, and that came from my years of recruiting experience. In previous recruitments, my gut had been right, so I assumed it would be again and weighted my intuition higher than other factors in the recruitment. However, I had had few opportunities to test my intuition. I was blind to my own blindness. So how do we develop blindness? We can consider our own mental models, which Peter Senge described as, I quote, deeply held internal images of how the world works, images that limit us to familiar ways of thinking and acting, end quote. Take a moment to think of a personal mental model you hold. 
Mental models can lead us to decide or believe something as simple as certain individuals are not trustworthy or more complex issues. These models also make it so that two people who sit next to one another and observe the same situation or hear the same presentation, for example, this presentation, come to two different conclusions. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever left a meeting and had a very different recollection or understanding of the material than the colleague sitting next to you? Let me share a couple of examples. In the post-secondary environment, our CFOs, our chief financial officers, meet on a regular basis. In late September, I had received an update from our CFO regarding the content of a recent meeting. And then about a week later, all the presidents were meeting. And I heard a president report back on a specific financial matter from the CFO meeting. I was quite surprised by what was being said as the update was very, very different than what I had heard from my CFO. As I examined the matter a little closer, I realized that perhaps one CFO's mental model is framed by the glass half empty and the other by the glass half full. If we don't seek to understand one another's mental models, decision-making can be problematic. This leads me to my second example. Each year, our Board of Governors gets together to consider outcomes from the previous year and update our strategic plan. If they leave that meeting with different mental models, the actions of individual board members and the executive team could be quite different. The action plans could align if we have the same mental model or could quickly diverge if we don't. For example, members could leave the planning session with a perspective that we are a risk-adverse organization or an entrepreneurial one, seemingly at opposite ends of the spectrum. Other opportunities to introduce bias might come from the composition of our teams. According to Rock, Grant, and Halverson, and Gray on homogeneous teams, people readily understand one another. They collaborate and they have a sensation of progress, whereas dealing with outsiders causes friction and can feel counterproductive. When tested in experiments, teams that contain outsiders had much higher success rates of answering challenging questions correctly, even though participants reported the work feeling more difficult. Diversity benefits our organizations when we're able to obtain a strong sense of team and organizational inclusion based on recognition of the value of differences we bring to the table. So what about the relationship between decision-making and gender? We have a strong team at Northwest College, a team I'm proud of. We have an all-female executive team. While I hired this team for their skills and fit, I've been considering how an all-female team might impact our decision-making, especially given the comment previously around the benefit of heterogeneous teams and how homogeneous teams work. There are some questions for us to consider. Do men and women bring different attributes or qualities to the decision-making table? Is our decision-making biased because we're all women? Will there be blind spots in decision-making if men and women come with different approaches? And finally, should gender even be a consideration? Unfortunately, it is not easy to answer these questions because the research on gender differences in decision-making is mixed. One study, for example, done in 2013 by Barton McQueen stated that female directors are better at making fair decisions when competing interests are at stake. The research showed that female directors tended to score higher than male directors in complex moral reasoning. Barton McQueen's research also argues that women tend to be more open to learning, more inquisitive, and actively try to understand the reasoning of others, leading to better overall performance. 
Here's an example that might better illustrate this from Banco and Pelster in the article, How Women Decide. Deloitte studied the differences between men and women when making decisions in business-to-business -business sales, such as deciding on a vendor for a contract. Noticing these anecdotal differences, Deloitte surveyed its senior managers and found that 70% perceived differences in selling to women versus men. Deloitte went on to interview male and female buyers of professional services from 18 major firms, such as Hewlett Packard and Blue Shield of California. The findings from this research showed that when women met with a potential service provider, they viewed it as an opportunity to explore options for collaboration, they were more inquisitive, they sought the opinions of, of others, and they looked for ideal solutions. One respondent said that even though he felt women could be more difficult or even fickle in their business dealings, they were also, I quote, much more rigorous in the way they explore possibilities and evaluate vendors, end quote. By comparison, men were found to look at meetings with vendors as a narrow, near final step in the decision process and ended conversations upon connecting with a good idea or solution. Deloitte recognized the differences in decision styles and realized that in order to remain competitive, they had to examine their assumptions about how to do business with the changing workforce, one that was seeing an increasingly number of women in roles with purchasing authority. Other research doesn't quite answer all of the questions I have about gender and decision making, especially this one. Does it matter if you have an executive team consisting of all females, all males, or a mix of both? We haven't seen a lot of research on a completely female executive group either. So what this means is we're learning as we go at Northwest College. And so I think we need to come to this question a bit differently. It might be better to approach effective decision making not simply as a trait that one either has or doesn't have, but as a product of context-dependent processes that are negotiated among participants. What do I mean by that? Well, the key word is participants. Rather than focusing on the gender of the leadership group, I believe the focus should be on creating a situation where opinions are respected and trusted enough to, an to have an open decision environment. There are several methods and tools leaders can employ to facilitate critical thinking and sound decision making. How do we surface, test, and improve our pictures of the world? How do I challenge my own models and the models of those around me? You might consider the following skills noted by Peter Senge to inform your thinking, reflection and inquiry. Reflection involves slowing your thinking process so that you're more aware of how we form mental models and how that turns into actions. And inquiry impacts how we operate in face-to-face -face interactions with others. I think as we hone our decision-making skills, inquiry becomes essential. In my own experience, I've noticed that at meetings with our senior leaders, it becomes more and more difficult to participate as an equal around the table. Unfortunately, this may leave, leave the leader in a quandary. As an executive, people expect you to make decisions and provide direction. But your role as a good executive is to hear from your team so that the best decisions are made. Sometimes, the very presence of a leader shifts the conversation. If a leader speaks, even if only offering opinion or perspective, the crowd can take this com these comments as direction. But how can the leader participate without unduly influencing the direction, especially if the comments are meant to be, not meant to be directive? This is where inquiry can be helpful. Saul, Melkman, and Payne suggest that even better than being aware of your own biases is to outsmart them by pushing yourself to think broadly about possible future outcomes of your decisions. 
you can consider these three messages, methods. Make three estimates. So rather than look at one and two in terms of options, put a third one in there, and it'll tend to get you closer to reality. Think twice. Consider a problem on two separate occasions. Sometimes you don't have the opportunity to do that because of time, but sometimes it's a really good thing to step back and rethink. And hold a pre-mortem, which is where you imagine a potential future failure and work backwards uh, to consider the cause. This might help you identify problems that you won't, wouldn't normally catch. You can temporally, temper an overly optimistic for, forecast, and it might help you to prepare backup plans. When working in teams, you might also consider assigning roles or the wearing of hats. And I'm sure you've all heard of the work of Edward de Bono, and he has done a lot of work on creative thinking and created the uh, six thinking hats. So just going quickly through the hats, you need to see the hats, there we go. Uh, the first is the white hat, and this is what happens is you assign somebody in the group and each of them wears uh, this particular hat and takes on this role. So the first is the white hat. This is the person who focuses on the facts. The yellow is the optimist. The black is the person who plays devil's advocate. Red, this is a participant who will focus on feelings and intuition and may identify fears and dislikes. Green, this is the creative person, anybody looking at all the new ideas and possibilities. And the blue is a person who observes the process as this exercise happens. When I think of the six hats, I often recall my time at Alberta Health Services. As you can imagine, every executive at AHS has makes significant decisions every day. They make decisions under time pressures with the best information available and based on their past experiences. At AHS, I had the responsibility for developing a patient safety approach, specifically an alert system for the province. Luckily, I had a great team with experience in patient safety and access to medical experts outside of my direct team. We made decisions based on good data by looking at patient safety alert systems around the globe, and we could test our discussions with various stakeholder groups. Well, it seemed like we had the right formula for successful decision making. We had a tendency to become too administrative and forget the very reason why we were doing the work we were, to create the best possible safety environment for the patient. So based on an experience I had had with a previous deputy minister, I did a version of the six hats with my team. In this case, I assigned one employee to be the patient and represent the red hat. Given that a medical error could impact the life of a patient, it was helpful to hear the voice of the patient. It was remarkable to watch the responses of our team as the assigned patient talked about their view on our decisions. In my view, this conscience improved our decision-making process. Over time and with practice, we learn to use various tools to produce sound decisions. As leaders move into roles with more and more responsibility and accountability, it's necessary for them to make challenging decisions in increasingly complex contexts. Leaders need to be able to assess and understand the context in which they are making a decision, make decisions in collaborations with others, and sometimes make decisions using imperfect information, and that information might come in a very un unpredictable way. CADI, in 2016, recommends using system lenses to consider the different vantage points for approaching a decision. Caddy talks about three lenses, ideology and beliefs, which include our beliefs, assumptions, and values, rational and irrational information processing. This lens considers the rational and irrational ways people obtain information, apply reasoning, and make decisions. I'm going to give you an example that might be a little controversial using the first two lenses. It might help you understand how ideology and beliefs 
and rational and irrational information processing come into play. This issue is medically assisted death. While some stakeholders might consider it morally wrong or a violation of their ethical or religious beliefs to give or receive medical aid in dying, others look at the same issue as one of compassion and choice. Some healthcare providers may believe that to aid a patient in dying is to uphold the philosophy of doing no harm. Two individuals who hold the opposite beliefs might find the other's decision completely irrational without looking at the problem through a different lens. The third lens described by Caddy is interpersonal and social dynamics. And these are the patterns and personal relationships regarding how leaders interact with others at various levels in their organization. And this lens can actually help us to look at how one profession may be at odds with another profession, or you may have one group in your organization struggling for power with another. Another skill decision makers should work on is integrative thinking. This thinking skill allows you to hold on to opposing or multiple ideas and use your creativity to generate a solution or to make a decision that incorporates elements of all ideas and is generally superior to any one of the individual inputs. This is the work of Martin. For example, as my experience in leadership roles progressed, I think I garnered a stronger ability to connect decisions to the bigger picture, drawing more innovation into this. As I gained more experience at Norquest, I started to connect the dots. And although I still use evidence, I find that I'm able to draw conclusions more quickly, conclusions that help me make decisions. But I soon discovered a pitfall in this. Sometimes I was getting to conclusions too quickly. Although I was connecting the dots, the people around me didn't always have the same information, thinking process, or vantage point in the organization. And therefore, they couldn't connect the dots. This was a sign to slow down. In this particular case, it was important for me to recognize that not everyone knew what I know, or did they necessarily think the way I think. So I had to make a decision to slow down. This example happened at a very stressful time in the organization, when our executive was managing large budget reductions due to reduced funding. What I saw in behaviors was a hunkering down to find budget dollars, and inadvertently the teams were thinking and deciding primarily as independent players related to their own functional areas. As a leader who didn't want to lose focus on our strategic plan in the future, settling into one's own area was not an option. So we needed a mechanism to regroup. <coughs> In the midst of the chaos of budget and high stress, I called a take a breath day. This was a full day dedicated to slowing down and ensuring that we were all on the same page. Not only did this allow us time to align our thinking and challenge our decisions, it created an opportunity to think as an organization and not in silos. In this example and many more, I found that people even if they don't agree with your decision, may be more inclined to support the decision if they understand the whys and hows that went into it. This takes us back to transparency. If people have enough information to trace the logic in a decision, it can be more understandable to them. So I have a pet peeve, and the pet peeve is that Many, many times when difficult decisions are made, there's a confusion between transparency and confidentiality. A simple yet clear definition of transparency offered by Sarna is, I quote, helping people to see into systems and understand why decisions are taking, taken, end of quote. This goes back to being able to reflect the why and how in your decisions. Sarna goes on to say that confidentiality is, I quote, 
The obligation and right not to disclose information to unauthorized individuals, entities, or processes if it would harm the organization, its business relationships, or an individual." End quote. As leaders transform organizations, they make many significant decisions. In my early years at the college, I recall leading a decision process to set forth a new strategic plan and transforming the college. Our leaders embarked on system one, so that intuition and gut, and system two, facts and analysis decision processes. They worked in a complex environment rooted in his history and were excited about the possibilities of our future. They did take time to consider the mental models of our students, employees, government, and the communities we serve. As we move toward the new strategic plan and a new organizational structure, decisions were being made and communicated. Emotions, both excitement and worry, were at the surface. And I recall that we had a great game plan to communicate our direction and the whys and hows of our decision making. I also remember in the context of the day, not all stakeholders had the same mental model. With some groups, conversations were respectful and optimistic, and with others, they were challenging. This is where the confusion set in with respect to transparency and confidentiality. Through this experience, I learned that while we had decision tools to draw from, it was also important to set out expectations for system thinking and acting, and to communicate the parameters of engagement, such as transparency and confidentiality. Decision-making is complex, as in the, is the environment that we make the decisions. As mentioned earlier, we make many decisions every day. In fact, when I took a look at the research to find out, well, how many decisions would that be, there were a lot of responses. Various sources, though, including Dr. Humans, identified that we make approximately 35,000 decisions a day. It's no wonder we feel taxed when making decisions. It's no wonder we need tools to assist us. And it's no wonder that decision-making processes change over time and with experience. As I come to the end of my talk, I realize that thinking about decision-making and not just deciding is of great benefit. It's allowed me to reflect on the techniques available as well as how practice can help. But I also know I have to be careful of my own biases. And sometimes making what others believe are irrational decisions can be a matter of perspective. Like once being told, I wasn't smart enough to attend college or university. This big decision to defy the logic of others required many other decisions about prioritization and balance. Through this, I overcame my own questions of capability to become confident as a decision maker. I've evolved through various career phases, aided by the tools I had available to me, but also by pushing myself to think in new ways, tackling challenges, and, and taking on specific roles, and considering problems from various perspectives. I believe being self-aware is the key to success as a decision maker and a leader. And as you move forward making decisions in the complex world in which we live, don't forget to assess the facts, pay attention to intuition, and reflect so that you can learn from your mistakes. If, I do, if you do this, I believe that you will lead from where you are in our community. Thank you. I wonder if we can even turn the lights up in the hall a little bit. It's a bit dark in here, and if we're not looking at the, uh, the screen, just so we can 
see our faces. Can somebody near a light switch there? Uh, that's a little better. Well, Dr. Abbott, thank you so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Our students are in the middle now <clears throat> of modules in their Foundations of Leadership course where they are learning that the way they think they think isn't necessarily how they think. <laughs> and uh, that self-awareness I think you've spoken of is really, really important. If we accept the fact that we need to think about how we think, it can be a great step in the right direction. But I was particularly interested in when you, you started at the beginning to talk about the difference between sort of <clears throat> slower thinking and data analysis and cogitation and gut thinking. And don't you think that there's a kind of a, a misunderstanding of the value of gut? I think when George W. Bush was president or running for president, he said that he, that he sort of went with his gut. And I thought, yes, but the problem is you have one of the least informed guts around. <laughs> Don't you, do you feel that, that, that there are ways that we can feed our gut instincts to make them more reliable? How has that happened with your experience? So I think um, your gut needs to be fed. Um, I think that we can get into big trouble if we only pay attention to gut. Um, we all live in a world where we have a lot of data and experience around us. And I think we have to be aware of that and we have to grab it. We have to use that data to help inform our gut. And I think that um, even the most experienced decision makers and leaders will get that gut wrong every once in a while. And I think if you go back on the research, one of the things is being blind to your own blindness. So you have to make sure that, that sometimes you test that. And we're not always comfortable in making mistakes. Um, I think we're in a, in a society where we want to do everything right, but we have to create an environment where we can fail, and we can talk about that failure, because I actually think that failure will help feed the gut. Yeah, I, I, assuming that you survive it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. To do it again. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when you say that we make 35,000 decisions a day, um, one of the you know, interesting uh, books that I read early on when I was trying to understand some of these issues relating to gender and how people responded was Virginia Valiant's book, Why So Slow, The Advancement of Women. And she talks about schemas, the kind of hypotheses that we create. And that's because we can't really consciously cogitate 35,000 right. times a day. Right. So we need to have the ability to make some decisions kind of reflexively and instinctively. Um, and you've talked, you talked uh, t today about how you kind of ratchet yourself back sometimes when you, you think you're, you're in a full flood. What are some of the ways in which, which uh, young people can, can learn to do that, to begin to make that distinction about when just going ahead with your reflexive response to something is good, but uh, recognizing when maybe they need to, to slow down a little bit? I think um, one of the things that's helped me a lot is talking it through with someone. And you don't always have that gift of time to do it. Um, but I think having someone who you can trust, who can be the devil's advocate, can poke you and push you in your thinking, I think that can allow you to step back and go, huh, I didn't think about that. And, and I always think in, in my office it's really important to have that person that you can trust that will give you that hard feedback um, that you maybe don't really want to hear, but you know you need to hear. So I think that can allow you to just step back and go, OK, hear that. I think the other thing is playing devil's advocate with yourself. So doing the plan and saying, well, if this goes wrong, what does it mean? And so putting on that other hat of the person who's going to argue against you. You know, I think what this means is that one of the things leaders have to pay a lot of attention to is the kind of decision-making culture they create in their organizations, whether it's a culture that encourages people to uh, raise uh, other questions or concerns because their knowledge may be able to divert your gut from making, from making a mistake. And I think of the books about the 2008 financial meltdown, uh, the, some of the books I've read about the collapse of Lehman Brothers, where it was almost a a classic 
uh, example of the wrong kind of decision-making structure where the people mm -hmm. who with the critical comments weren't there. Do you find it easy to do that? I mean, it's, sometimes it's easier to, you know, to have people who are comfortable, that you're comfortable with, that aren't always questioning you. But I think uh, that's a challenge for a leader. I think in trying to change an entire culture that is um, uh, afraid to speak up, in afraid of inquiry, it's tough. It's slow. It's slow going. And I think one of the things you can do to really get uh, a shift to begin to begin is to demonstrate something where someone had a very public in, in inquiry of you. So you're at a, a staff meeting with 600 people, and someone asked you the hardest question in the room, and you survived it, and they survived it. Because I think what it does is it builds trust in your organization that it's OK to ask those tough questions. And um, when I think of, of my early days at Northwest College, where we were going through a reorganization where um, really we hadn't had significant change in the organization. And I remember going into some of the town hall meetings where people were very emotionally charged and really wanted to understand uh, why the decisions were being made as they, as they were. I think the most important thing I did is I showed up. And I had those questions come at me and responded in the best way that I possibly could because it showed that it was OK to question. Um, and as I always say to people, you might not always like what I have to say to you, but I will always say it in a respectful manner. And so hopefully, we both learn from that. And I think what that means, too, is that the gut instincts and the gut reflexes of the people who are in your audience, um, if they feel a sense of transparency and openness, they associate that with something they can trust. Mm -hmm. So their gut reaction is often, it's often not so much even a, a, an intellectual conscious reaction, but it's an emotional bond and a, and a response that, that breeds trust. So it goes both ways, your own uh, yeah. questioning, but also how the audience perceives you or how your listeners perceive you. I think as well with that, with that, if you're trying to shift a culture, you have to make sure that your leadership teams um, are aligned with that because it can be really difficult if you have five people on your team and you have three who are willing to take the risk, willing to have failure, willing to hear the feedback, and then you have two that are the opposite because I think you can really fracture your organization and you can also have it where um, you know certain teams will say, but the president said this is how we're going to behave and I'm not seeing this. So they, the people under individuals who are maybe pushing back on that, will be less likely to come forward. So you have to try to work across the organization as well as up and down in the organization, I think, when you're trying to make that kind of change. I was interested that you said that you had a, a totally female executive. And uh, one of the things we'll be looking at when we get into our module on diversity is a lot of the issues on how gender barriers are created. But one of the interesting um, ideas that I've encountered in the work of some people like Judy Rosner, on, who looks at women in, in corporate structures, is that sometimes the way women respond, the fact that they're more power sharing and open, et cetera, is often a reflection of their lack of power and the, the uh, mechanisms they learn uh, when they're in an environment where their right to be there isn't necessarily uh, accepted, so they have to be more inquiring and more social, trying to create uh, relationships. Although sometimes, if people are comparing them to men, that's perceived as weak. And yet now people are coming to see that wherever the source of it, it may actually have some benefit. Yeah, and I think with our team, um, it's you know it was interesting. We were building a relatively new executive team. We went out. We looked for the skill sets that we needed. And it just happened that every great candidate was a woman. But it's also interesting that we've been very aware of that as a team. And we've said, you know, when we have our executive retreat, I asked this group of women, our executive leaders, so would we approach this differently, um, either if the uh, issue was slightly different or if we had um, a different mix in the room. And so it's, it's bringing this to our awareness. And I think regardless if it's 
if it's an all-male team or an all-female team or a mixed team, I think it's important um, to ask yourself, would we be any different if our team was different? Because I think you'll get to a better place in your deliberations. I think it's also uh, true that very often, uh, because men are, I mean, we live in a society where leadership is still, to some degree, gendered masculine, and men are sort of accepted in those roles, so that if men want to you know, use their gut instinct or whatever, or take risks, that it's more acceptable and it's seen as somehow a masculine thing. And I think the optimal situation is kind of a blend of the both, mm -hmm. that, uh, that often uh, having uh, that kind of push uh, can be very helpful, as well as the, the pullback of the more, the more thoughtful, uh, uh, reflective approach. I think we all need to be all things, and for whatever reason, we have these Predis predispositions. It's, uh, yeah, and I it's think when you look at um, successful leaders, managers, executive, whatever it is, I think the majority of them do have that mix because they have the EQ and they're able to analyze all the facts and make the decisions. The reality is when you're in leadership roles, often you do not have a lot of time to make decisions and you have imperfect information. So I think you have to draw from all of those skill sets. Um, to be balanced in your decisions. And I love your, um, your idea of the take a breath day. That's a, that, where did that idea come from? Because it's a, it's a very, you immediately understand what we mean by it. But that notion of it's, it's not a, a strategic planning session, it's, it's, it's a very different uh, goal that you're, that you're setting for yourself. In it. I think in, in this case, we were in this chaotic environment where deadlines were crazy, we were having to make hard decisions, behaviors weren't what we all wanted them to be because of the level of stress. And it, I know some of the team originally were saying, this is totally counterintuitive. We have a lot of work to do and you're pulling us out of the office for a full day to regroup. And um, you know, it was, it was an interesting conversation because of the beginning of the day wasn't so easy because it was a lot of pushback on, we've got a lot to do, why are we doing this? Well, because this is for our long-term health of our organization and for us to get through the, the challenging time we were getting through. And in the end, it was a fantastic day because it was, you know, phones off, no email, we're stuck together in a room, whether we like it or not, and let's make sure that we work together because we have to survive this and we got to come out the other end. And I think in the end it helped, to, helped us to rebalance and feel grounded. And do you think people could take that approach individually? A student who's feeling overwhelmed, can you, maybe not a whole day, but a... <laughs> <laughs> take a whole day. <laughs> I do, I think, it's, I think it's even if you take an hour, you know, if your take a breath is to go for a massage or go to the gym, make sure you build that in because I think it is, allows for a clearing of the mind and then you can return. I think you're much better off when you return because you have rejuvenated yourself. You talked about your, uh, your other career or your remarkable avocation as a figure skating judge. Can you talk about maybe some of the other leadership lessons you've learned in that world? Because, you know, we're all, I think all of us love to watch, I don't know, I love to watch figure skating and uh, it's wonderful, especially when we have Kurt Brownings to do it. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, is there cheating and judging and uh, the, the high stakes, but it must be a very interesting crucible to, to learn about decision making and about leadership challenges. Yeah, I think the, um, I've always said to my employers, there's this great balance because I can be in the figure skating world and what I learn there can be brought back into my work world. And what I've found is that, um, you know, for the audience, you see great skating. For the judge on the panel, and there's been some studies done, our heart rate is going through our throat when we're having to put in a score for everything that's being done. And so you learn to work under very high stress. Uh, you have very little time to make a decision and we don't always make the right decisions. And then you have an overlay 
of uh, different cultures. People, uh, all of our judging panel, were all from different countries, different cultures, different ways of working. And so you learn about uh, kind of the broader world view and the highest level of politics. And I think that um, that has uh, allowed me to gain a lot more skill than if I didn't have that opportunity. It's interesting when you talked about uh, not, you know, or seeing, seeing the jump that you expected to see that Kurt Browning did. Um, there is a, 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 an idea, and um, his name just got, gone out of my head for a minute. He's now the co-director of the uh, Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School, will come to me in a second. Um, but he's written a book called Noticing, and he talks about that people can look at a video and there's a gorilla that walks mm -hmm. across the screen and the, but they're watching a basketball game and nobody notices the grow, all of these kinds of things. Yeah. And I think it's hard for us to accept the fact that we, that even visually, I mean, we know in, in criminal justice that eyewitness testimony is often incredibly unreliable, that people uh, think they see things that they don't, they don't <coughs> see. So these are really, uh, you know, kind of uh, challenging things to accept in ourselves. It is, and I think in, in figure skating, when you're judging, you have a very short period of time. In the Kurt example, we had watched him over and over and over do this triple jump, and it goes quickly, so it, you know you assess it, and it's this sense after on how could I possibly have missed that when you see the video replay, and it's clear as day that it was a triple and not a double. And, um, it is, it's a, it's a terrible feeling because you have skills, you've been well trained, you've done this a million times and you still make a mistake. So again, it goes back to being able to make a mistake, debrief on it and say, okay, so how do I catch that the next time, whether it's Kurt or any other athlete coming out? One of the um, most interesting examples of a decision-making challenge for somebody in my generation. And when I was a young undergraduate uh, political science student, there was a book by Graham Allison called The Essence of Decision. It was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and many of you will know about it when it became uh, known that the Soviet Union was putting <clears throat> nuclear missiles into Cuba. And uh, there was a very short period of time that was available to try and turn this around. And the American president had to deal with uh, uh, this, this terrible crisis and his, his military wanted to go in and bomb Cuba and that would have been a, the, the, the setting off of a nuclear war which would have been a terrible thing. And one of the interesting things we know, I mean President Kennedy did a number of different things and he sent people to back challenges, back channel discussions and he didn't accept the, the views of his military and, and maybe because his gut was better trained mm -hmm. because they had supported the, going into um, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, and so when that was a disaster, he was less trustful. So it's, it's an example of feeding your gut that you have an experience and you go, wait a minute, these guys, they may have lots of flashy epaulets, but they don't always get it right. Maybe I should ask somebody else. But you know what President Kennedy did during that crisis when it was a very, very scary thing in 1962? He actually took naps. And during World War II, Winston Churchill took naps regularly. And it's interesting, this relationship. Now, obviously, physically, we need to be rested to make good decisions. But it's also that kind of sense of, of not falling into the trap of wanting to make decisions very, very fast. And I think that's something, in so many different contexts, we feel that pressure. Yeah, and I think, um, I think we do feel that pressure. And especially when you have a team around you saying, I need a decision, I need a decision. And, you know, it's, it's not always a crisis, but sometimes our behavior and our anxiety goes up and up and up and we create our own crisis. Um, and I think with experience, uh, individuals can get more calm and not fuel that crisis and just say, whoa, 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 stop for a minute. We need to think about this. Um, sometimes as simple as I'm going to go back to what I used to do years ago with my pro-con list, because sometimes just the action of doing that will slow it down enough that you can actually think about it rather than jump to something. Um, and I think we all also have to remember what we did once doesn't always mean it'll work 
the next time because our environment changes around us so rapidly and the people around us change. So the context can be slightly different and it can be a disaster or the context can be slightly different and you could do the same thing and, and be very successful. It's the heart of leadership is the ability to make decisions and understanding our own cognitive biases and understanding the, uh, the bad situations we can create for ourselves that do not optimize our mm -hmm. ability to make decisions. And I wonder what would have happened if the Cuban Missile Crisis had happened in the middle of a, the 24-hour news cycle, right. which later came on the kind of pressure that puts on. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Abadar. Some of our students will be now having the opportunity, whether well, all of them will continue the discussion and some will have the op opportunity to continue their conversation with you. But I really uh, very much appreciate this launching of our decision-making discussions because we really do need to accept the fact that we have a lot to learn about how we make decisions uh, and that these, these challenges are not because we're not smart or we're not good or whatever, it's just we're very human and we've developed all sorts of, of reactions that may not serve us well. But the, uh, the wonderful thing about living today is all of these wonderful researchers who've looked at how we make decisions and can help us create the best structures and the best opportunities to be not just smart, but also to be wise. And that's what we aim to be. So again, thank you, Dr. Jody Abbott, for coming in and launching this wonderful discussion.